Five of five, we're on the home stretch. Image storage. So thinking back to the goals we talked about at the very, very beginning, if we're intending to capture images for archive and we want to capture the highest quality images with the best technology we have available to us and we want to save and maintain that collection across time, no matter what that requires, which means may require converting things and expanding storage space and duplicating things several times, that's what we're going to have to do. In addition to some of those, those positive things that result from maintaining an archive, some pluses include you can create new derivatives as technology evolves. So as, say for example, monitors become exponentially more uh, highly defined, you can see the value of those images if you exported another set of images that had a higher resolution, for example, you could see them better. Um, it also allows you to query your existing set of images and avoid photographing things again without need. Um, so, what's the best setup? Well, you really there isn't a, a perfect setup, but I suggest you think about these three things and think of it as a pipeline of your, of your images moving from your camera, working through processing, ultimately ending up in the archive to stay there. So the working, files, the working file storage or that hard drive space that you need for the files that you're working on right now, be that your laptop hard drive that captured the images or the computer that you're working on from which you transferred the images. Uh, the images from the hard uh, from the laptop, um, but they're not ready to archive yet. Then you want to think about your archive storage, which is the actual place, probably on site, where your images will stay. It's it's not liquid, meaning they won't come in and out of there. They'll stay there. Um, and this isn't your copy. This is your main one, and it's important that it be stable, and that it can grow. And then finally you have your backup, which is your parallel to your primary. And you can have several of these. You can have several hard drives that duplicate your, your primary. Um, and it's best that it be removed from the, the physical location where is the primary. You need them, not, not all your eggs in one basket. And it's, it's best media even then to save, in, or it's best practice to save in another media type, just in case. So a lot of people still save to optical disc, meaning CD, DVD, or if you have the option to save to tape. So what, if, what are some of your basic setups? I suspect most of you will have a setup like this, which is perfectly fine. You have your computer, which is the computer to which you save the images from the camera, where you do the image processing, and you're working with the images on your working processing hard drive, you move them to your primary archive, and then you back them up. If you should be so lucky and you work at an institution that provides you with a network storage space, I highly recommend you take advantage of that. So that would involve you working at your, your own workstation, you save your working images here, through the internet, you transfer them to the server, there they get backed up on this server, the hard drive, as well as to tape or to optical disk. What are the formats? So this goes back to the question he asked earlier about TIFFs versus JPEGs versus RAW. What does all that mean? Well, in terms of image archiving, we want to capture the highest quality image that the camera can produce. And if you're using a DSLR, it'll most likely be RAW. It has the most information, the most data in that image file. And it hasn't been rendered. So different types of RAW formats include what we call a, a digital negative or a DNG. This is kind of a newer type of raw file format. Um, it's open source, which means a lot of people have the option to um, make adaptations. And like most things, when the people have the opportunity to have a say in how things go, it tends to survive. So the likelihood that this format survives the test of time is higher than uh, a camera proprietary raw file type. Take for example Kodak. 
So Kodak, to our surprise, a few years ago went bankrupt. Who would have thought that? So all of your image files that were Kodak proprietary raw files had to be converted to something else because Kodak was not to be supported into the future. So you have to keep that in mind. You want to save to the format um, that is most likely to survive the test of time. So DNG is open. It's Adobe. Um, it's small relative to some others. Um, it supports embedded metadata. This is something that's really critical. So all the information that you add about the image textually or any instructions for Im uh, image editing gets saved in here. It doesn't change what the camera took. The raw image file is still in there, but it saves the instructions that you think should be applied to it that make it look good, make it look the way you think it should. And you can always undo those instructions. So it saves them in the XML. In contrast, uh, other raw file types, the proprietary raw file types, attach a sidecar. So let's talk about that. <coughs> so proprietary camera raw formats include the Canon that we just converted from, the CR2. Nikons have NEFs, Pentax PEFs. So anytime you see these special extensions, it means it's a raw file type. It's a very high quality, lots of data image file type, but software specific to this camera is the one that can open it. Photoshop can open it, Lightroom can open it, but most other software can't open it. It doesn't support embedded metadata. So if in Lightroom I say, uh, I type in a bunch of keywords about this picture, flower, anther, etc., and I save the metadata, it doesn't get saved in here as a list of instructions. That stays originally as the camera spit it out. What it does is it creates a set of instructions as a sidecar file next to it. There's nothing directly linking these two together except the fact that they're physically located in the same folder. So if anyone who doesn't know anything about sidecar files comes along, sees this, thinks it's unnecessary, deletes it, you've lost all the information that was saved. You still have the original, uh, you still have the original image as it came out of the camera, but you lose the instructions. So there's a risk there. And then we have the TIFF, which stands for Tagged Image File Format. So it's not a raw file type. It actually has been rendered um, in which a situation in which you lose some information, but it's considered what we call a lossless compression, which means it interprets the original raw data and then adds a whole bunch of other data to try and preserve that. So it actually ends up being much larger in size. So it takes up much more hard drive, city, hard drive space than does a DNG. Um, we recommend that you save the unedited version because you don't, um, I don't think after you save it, you can go back in time. And every time you save it, you lose a little data. Um, so as far as your archive's concerned, don't edit it. Um, but it does support embedded metadata. So everything that you import into the image about where you took it, who collected it, et cetera, uh, copyright information, it does get written into the image. So it won't have a sidecar file next to it. So if you can't save as DNG or DNGs aren't feasible for you and you don't want to save as the camera raw, TIFFs are okay. This was the archive, um, archival basis for, for a lot of people for a lot of years. And only more recently are people converting to DNGs. <coughs> so just to give you an idea about maintaining uh, and managing archives and how you have to constantly revisit them and make sure that you're keeping them up to date. We had uh, a huge server that was full of different file types. They were archival file types or archival quality but over 13 years of digitizing with different cameras and different, different ideas of what's the best archive type we had a whole mix of things. So we had at least two raw file types one of which was about to be obsolete, so we had to convert it fast. We had a bunch of duplicates. We had um, orphan SIDs, which is another proprietary derivative, so we needed to get those open and convert it to something else before we ran out of time. And then a whole bunch of the GPI herb scan images, which were huge, huge. So what did we do? All of those that were really unnecessary, we converted. 
those that were the originals. We didn't delete them. We just took them off the server and backed them up onto tape. So all of those legacy, soon to be obsolete image file types, we didn't delete them. We moved them off, but we converted them to a new, uh, new file type that would stand a greater test of time. We compressed the GPI images that were 200 megabytes to 90 megabytes per image. And in so doing, we freed up, we freed up 19 terabytes of space, which is a lot. So keep that in mind. So thinking back to our, our Lightroom and exporting images for archive and images for access, we use, we convert from the camera raw to the DNG, and this goes to the archive. Once we've processed it, goes to the archive, it stays there. If I need to make another JPEG copy 10 years down the line from it, this is my master copy, I make a JPEG from it. At the same time as I make the DNG, I make the JPEG. These both have the same information, the same instructions, the difference being this is a much, much smaller file type, less information, compressed. And by compression, I mean that it has decided pixels of similar or the same color in terms of data uh, are combined. As we know with image um, processing, if you increase the exposure, sometimes details come out of the shadows. So you start to see hairs in, in what looked like a shadowed area. When you go to JPEG, you, can't, you lose that. You lose the ability to add light or, or add shadow. So we, these are in sRGB. So having lost that information is called lossy compression. You'll hear that expression. And you can't go back and edit this. You can't, well, say, I want to make it brighter. I want to make it darker. I want to make it sharper. In so doing, it just starts to look um, like uh, artifacts pop up. You see edges where there shouldn't be edges. It should be round. You start to see edges of pixels. So to put this all into context with regard to how you might um, include imaging in your specimen workflow, so we've photographed the specimens. We copied, uh, photographed them. We moved the raw files to an external drive. We processed them in Lightroom. We exported DNGs and JPEGs. The DNGs go straight to the archive, and it gets backed up on another. The JPEGs get cropped. They run through the OCR. They're grayscaled first. And then the full-size RGB JPEGs go into the database, which goes online. So this is our access, this is our archive. And just like before, I highly recommend these resources. These are people who have done it before. Some incredible websites that I found really helpful. This is the iDigBio um, information on specimen digitization all types. Um, Everything, including equipment specs and imaging manuals for the Tritrophic project is here. And that's it. Any questions about that phase?